Who Were the Beals? By Jeff Edgers, illustrated by Jeremy Tuggo. Who were the Beals? They were known as the Fab Four. And they were so famous that if you just said John, Paul, George, and Ringo, people knew who you were talking about. They looked different from most young guys in the early 1960s. They wore their hair longer. Reporters called them the mop tops. Their clothes were different, too. They wore collarless suit jackets, which buttoned all the way to the top. Their accents were different, too, because they were from England. Liverpool, England. Before that, all the biggest pop stars were American. Most of all, their music sounded different. It was rock and roll, but not like anything kids had heard before. When the band came to the United States for the first time, concert stadiums sold out. People went wild. Girls fainted. Newspapers called it the British Invasion. They were even bigger than Elvis. Then, when they were at their most popular, the Fab Four broke up. Yet more than 40 years later, their songs are still huge hits. In November 2010, it was front-page news when all 13 of their studio albums became available on iTunes. Who was this band? The Beatles, the greatest rock group ever. Chapter 1. John Lennon. There was nothing quiet about John Lennon, not even the day he was born. It was October 9, 1940. World War II was raging in Europe. Liverpool, England, was being bombed by the Germans. But baby John couldn't wait. His mother, Julia, went to the hospital and gave birth at seven in the morning. As he arrived, the walls of the hospital shook from falling bombs. Even before the war, Liverpool was a gloomy place to live. Once a thriving seaport, the rain-soaked city had become run down. Many factories were closing and those that remained open didn't have enough jobs. Poor families were crammed into small apartments in the slums of town. At first, John lived with his mother and grandparents. John's father, Alfred, was never around. He worked on a ship and was gone for months on end. As hard as she tried, John's mother couldn't make enough money to support her baby son. For a little over a year, Alfred sent checks home. Then the checks stopped, and Alfred stopped writing. Julia couldn't even afford to get John his own bed. He ended up sleeping in hers. Things grew worse, John's family began to fight over where he should live. Julia wanted him to stay with her. He was her son. But she had trouble taking care of him. John's Aunt Mimi also wanted the boy. She said that John would be better off with her. Mimi lived in a big house in a better part of town. John's father tried to take him, too. One weekend, John went to visit his father, whose boat had docked in Liverpool. Alfred asked the boy, only five years old, if he wanted to go on an adventure. They would travel together to a faraway country called New Zealand. Sure, John said. It sounded like fun. Then Julia found out what Alfred was planning. She told him to stay away. But much as she wanted John, Julia saw that her son needed a better home. In the end, she decided to send him to Mimi. Despite all of this, John was a happy boy. Pictures from those days show him with a big smile on his face, whether he was riding his bike or standing with the family dog, Sally. Mimi gave him lots of books. Along with reading, John liked to make monsters and skeletons out of paper and paste them over his bed. Because John was so young, he didn't really know that it was unusual to live with his aunt and have his mother visit. Besides, Julia acted more like a buddy than a mother. She loved to tell jokes, make funny faces, and sing. She taught John how to play the banjo, an instrument similar to a guitar. From Julia, John heard stories about his banjo-playing grandfather, who had moved to the United States. 
It was John's mother who gave him his first guitar she also taught him how to play it. Aunt Mimi had lots of rules. She expected John to come home after school to do homework. She wanted him to go co-bed early. She often had good reason to get mad A.C. John. As he got older, John got into more trouble. He was smart, but he didn't work hard. He did well only in art class. John spent most of his time making little books of poems and drawings. He also got into fights with other kids. And he sometimes made fun of his teachers, even when they were right there in the room. Perhaps he was acting up out of sadness. A few months before his 18th birthday, Julia was hit by a car and died. John was heartbroken. Years later, he wrote the song Julia about her. As a teenager, the one thing John got serious about was music. When he was 15, he heard rock and roll for the first time. Until then, most music heard on the radio was soft music, sung by such stars of the day as Perry Como and Doris Day. Rock was different. The music was loud. It had a strong beat and you could jump around to it. Many grown-ups hated it. Teenagers loved it. Rock had exciting stars. John's favorite singer was Elvis Presley. Elvis was from Tupelo, Mississippi. He had thick black hair, which he slipped up with grease. He wore his shirt unbuttoned so his bare chest would show. His jeans were very tight. And when Elvis sang, he swiveled his hips. Girls went crazy. Boys admired him. But many adults thought he was a bad influence. When Elvis went on television, he was only shown from the waist up. That way, nobody could see him dancing. Elvis Presley Born in Mississippi, Elvis Presley was the first real rock star. He was a white singer who captured the sound of African-American blues musicians. There were other white singers who did this, too, but Elvis was the most exciting. Elvis recorded his first song in 1953, My Happiness. He paid for it himself as a gift to his mother. For a while, he worked in a machine shop and drove a truck. Eventually, he was discovered. His hits included Hound Dog and Heartbreak Hotel. As he became more popular, people stopped calling Elvis by his real name. Instead, he became the king of rock and roll. John started dressing like Elvis, right down to the greasy hair. He also decided to play guitar. Mimi didn't approve. She wanted John to take piano or violin lessons and wouldn't pay for guitar lessons. John kept on playing guitar, anyway. He was a natural. Soon, John formed his own band at school. It was called the Quarrymen. Still, Mimi wouldn't let him in the house with his new instrument. John had to practice outside, in the garden. A guitar's all right, Mimi told him. But you'll never earn your living by it. Chapter 2 Paul McCartney To Beatles fans, Paul McCartney was always known as the cute one. He had long eyelashes and big brown eyes and shaggy hair. He also sang some of the group's most romantic songs, the ballads. As a kid, though, Paul was chubby. His brother Michael picked on him and called him fatty. Paul tried not to let it bother him too much. And as he got older, he started to lose his baby fat. Paul was born on June 18, 1942. His mother, Mary, had a private hospital room. Poor women usually had to share a room with other brand new moms, and the McCartney family didn't have much money. But Mary worked as a nurse, so the hospital treated her like family. Paul was a pretty good kid. His grades were good, especially in Latin, and he made lots of friends. He liked to draw and write. He liked girls and bragged to all of his friends when he had his first kiss. He loved music, too. Like John, 
Paul couldn't believe what he was hearing when an Elvis Presley song came on the radio. It sounded so different. Paul also liked Little Richard, a black singer. Elvis was cool and handsome, but Little Richard wore bright makeup, acted wild on stage, and sang songs called Tutti Frutti and Good Golly Miss Molly. Actually, Little Richard didn't just sing. He screamed. When he played piano, Little Richard got so excited, he had to stand up. Sometimes, he kicked the piano bench away. Paul learned to imitate Little Richard's loud yells. That annoyed most adults. Much later, those shouts became part of some of the Beatles' most famous songs, like She Loves You and Twist and Shout. Paul also liked to dress up as a rock star. He wore his pants tight and let his hair grow longer than the other kids. Less no surprise that Paul listened to so much music when he was a kid. His father, Jim, played piano and once led a group called Jim Max Jazz Band. Jim set up a radio in Paul's room so he could listen to music as he fell asleep. Paul's uncle gave him a trumpet. But Paul's favorite instrument was the guitar. Why? Because Elvis played one. Guitars were made for right-handed people, but Paul was left-handed. So, he had to rest ring it upside down to play it. And, boy, did he play it. The minute he got a guitar, that was the end, said Michael, Paul's younger brother. He was lost. He didn't have time to eat or chink about anything else. He played it while he sat on the toilet and while he was in the bath. He played it everywhere, Michael said. Paul became even more serious about music when his mother became ill. It started with a pain in her chest. In those days, doctors didn't have all the tests there are today to figure out what was wrong with a patient they sent Mary home, which was a big mistake. When the pain didn't go away, Mary went back in this time, the doctor told her the terrible news. She had breast cancer and probably wouldn't live long. Mary cried when she found out, but she didn't tell her sons. She didn't want to upset them. She died on October 31st. 1956. Paul was only 14 years old. Paul prayed that she would come back, but he knew she wouldn't. He wondered how his family could ever be the same. Overwhelmed, Paul turned his sadness into music. He wrote his first song and called it I Lost My Little Girl. Chapter Ringo Starr Of all the Beatles, Ringo had the hardest childhood. The oldest Beatle, he was born on July 7, 1940, the first and only child of Elsie and Richard Starkey. He was named after his father, although his father left when Ringo was only three and rarely returned to visit. Later, after Richard became a musician, he changed his name to Ringo Starr. A musician would often take a different name, called a stage name, because he or she thought it sounded better. As a boy, Ringo was lonely. Elsie would watch her son stare out of the window, wishing he had a brother or sister. Then, at age six, things got worse. Ringo got sick. He felt a terrible pain on his right side it was appendicitis. Appendicitis is easy to fix, but no one thought to take him to the doctor until he got really sick. Ringo was rushed to the hospital, where the doctor put him to sleep and took out his appendix. But after the operation, Ringo didn't wake up. He was in a coma. For ten weeks, Ringo's body stayed asleep. When he did wake up, he still felt sick. So, he ended up staying in the hospital for a whole year until he was well again. When he finally returned to school, Ringo found it hard to catch up. He tied his best, as one of his teachers wrote on a report card. But he kept failing tests. He didn't know as much as his classmates did. What's worse, he got sick again. When Ringo was 13, he caught a cold that got much worse. He had trouble breathing and had to go to the hospital again. This time, he stayed for two years. One good thing did come out of his time away from home. 
In the hospital, Ringo learned to play drums. The hospital had a band travel around from room to room to play music. It was a way to cheer up other kids who were there. Ringo had always been interested in drumming. He used to tap along to the rhythm of any song he heard. Now, in the hospital, he was given a drum to bang on and he loved it. When Ringo went home, he built his own drum set out of metal cookie containers. He used small pieces of firewood for his sticks. Music gave him something fun to do while all his friends were outside, playing. Also, he had fallen so far behind in his class that he didn't feel smart. He ended up dropping out of school at 15. But no matter what, he was really good at drumming. Because he wasn't in school anymore, Ringo had to find a job. He worked on a train, carrying messages back and forth to people. There were no such things as cell phones back then. He served drinks on a boat. He got a job fitting pipes together so water could move through them. Even though he made enough money, Ringo knew he needed more out of life. He just wasn't happy. When Ringo turned 18, his mother bought him a set of real drums. It was the best gift she could have given him. He practiced making a steady beat. He made the cymbals ring out when he hit them with his drumsticks. He formed a band. They were called the Eddie Clayton Skiffle Group. The band played mainly during breaks for workers at the pipe-fitting plant. That was fine with Ringo, though. He didn't need to get rich and be famous. It was enough just to be in a band. Chapter 4 George Harrison George Harrison had the happiest childhood of the Beatles. He didn't have the sadness of losing his mother as Paul and John did. He didn't get sick like Ringo. He was the youngest of four children. He was also the youngest Beatle, born on February 25, 1943. Harold, his father, drove a bus. Louise, his mother, taught ballroom dancing. But little George wasn't interested in dancing. He wasn't interested in music, either. He was a quiet boy. As he got older, he wore tight pants and grew his hair long, even though the other kids made fun of him for it. George used to tell them he kept his hair long because the scissors his father used weren't sharp, and so every snip hurt. Of course, that wasn't true. He just liked the way his hair looked. Music came into George's life when he was 14. That's when he heard a British singer named Lonnie Donegan. The music Lonnie Donegan played was similar to rock and roll, except it was faster. They called this new music skiffle. George loved the sound of it and begged his mother to buy him a guitar. She finally agreed and bought one for five dollars. George taught himself how to play. He practiced so much that the tips of his fingers started to bleed. Eventually, though, George got the hang of it. Soon he wanted a better guitar. An electric guitar. An electric guitar is much louder because when it's plugged in, the sound runs through a speaker. Even though the guitar was $60, his mother bought it for him. Before long, George had formed a band with one of his older brothers, Peter. They called themselves the Rebels and played their first show at a club in Liverpool. Soon after, George was on a bus and met Paul. They started talking about music and realized they had a lot in common. They started meeting at George's house to practice music together. While Paul loved to sing, George was more interested in playing guitar. He was actually too scared to sing in front of people. 